Welcome to the Wounds of the Faithful podcast, brought to you by DSW Ministries. Your host is singer, songwriter, speaker, and domestic violence advocate, Diana Winkler. She is passionate about helping survivors in the church heal from domestic violence and abuse and trauma. This podcast is not a substitute for professional counseling or qualified medical help. Now, here is Diana. Hello. Thanks for stopping in to listen today. I am grateful for your support. I aim to be a positive place for you to come to hear some fantastic guests, hear some music, and get some tools to help you heal. It is a crazy world out there right now. Yeah, and it's especially made worse by social media, don't you think? I have been following the takeover of Twitter, and I'm not sure what's going to transpire in the next few months as far as content creators go. But just a reminder for you to sign up for my newsletter to keep in touch with me. If something happens to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok, I can still reach you. I read that the government may ban TikTok in the future, so that's an example. Anyway, you'll get the latest news and music and some free gifts. I'm recording a lot of music right now. So if you want free music downloads from me, you will get free download of your choice if you are on my newsletter. That includes the new ones. You'll also get my hand-picked list of the best resources for abuse survivors. I only send a newsletter out quarterly, so I will not be invading your inbox every day. So, we have a wonderful guest for you today. We've got Kimberly Clark in the house. Kimberly is a Navy veteran. We haven't had any veterans on the show lately. We've had some in the past. I always like to support our veterans. And she's a survivor of military sexual trauma. After being medically discharged and diagnosed with PTSD, Kimberly struggled with severe drug addiction and alcoholism for the next 10 years. Then after finding recovery, Kimberly went on to become a peer support specialist. She published her book, Stuck Between Pleasure and Pleasing God. And she is a Louisiana state leader of a national nonprofit organization raising awareness of veteran suicide. So we really love to support our veterans again. I come from a military family, so I don't want to delay any further my conversation with Kimberly Clark. Here she is. All right, please welcome Kimberly Clark to the show. Hi, glad to be here. Thank you for having me. We are so honored to have a Navy veteran on the show today. My dad is a Navy veteran. He served during Vietnam on an aircraft carrier. And I also have other family members in the military. So we like to thank you for your service, of course. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. Now you're here to talk about your new book, Stuck Between Pleasure and Pleasing God. Yes, and, yes. and of course, we're going to hear your riveting story, your journey towards healing from multiple abuses, PTSD, and drug abuse. But first, we, uh, we want to hear about you. And I understand you have two wonderful kids. I do. I do. I have a 10 year old girl and a seven year old boy. Wow. Yeah. Those are great ages. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> busy, busy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you're a jiu jitsu practitioner. I am. I started doing Brazilian jiu jitsu about three years ago. And yeah. I fell in love with it. Absolutely. I love it. 
Yeah, I'm a uh, martial artist myself. And so we definitely want to unpack that more today as part of your story. So I wanted to start with setting the scene for us from the beginning. What was your childhood like? You were raised by a single mom, right? Correct. Correct. I was raised by a single mom. My dad, he was alive, but he wasn't a prison dad, right? So he would come around every so often. He was an alcoholic. He'd always be drinking or drunk, always barefoot with the bottle of W.O.L. in his hand. And so I knew him, but I knew of him, but I didn't know him, right? I didn't know his personality. I didn't know what he acted like on a sober day. I didn't know anything really about it. All I knew was that he was this drinker. And uh, yeah, my mom, she raised us. Uh, I'm one of three. I'm the baby of three. And she did the best she could. And I truly believe she did an awesome job. I remember her always having a job to take care of her. Sometimes too, she, she did what she had to do. And no matter how tired she was, we was always in church. And so I do, I do value that she put more morals and values and standards in me at an early age. And so even though I did stray away, very far away, I knew what to come back to because of that. But I had a loving and supportive family. There was some emotional abuse from family members and some, I guess, sexual assault because it wasn't sexual abuse. But besides that. People's love and support, you know, I had extremely low self-esteem because of their emotional abuse. I was always I was ugly or too fat or I was always just too soft or not enough. And I felt so alone. I felt, I just felt different. I knew I was different because of that. And I was always afraid to say no, right? I didn't know how to say no. I didn't, I haven't, I hadn't found my voice growing up, right? And so I think that had a lot, to, I know that had a lot to do with it. Some of the emotional abuse and physical abuse, I mean, sexual assault from some of those family members growing up. So was that like extended family or your immediate family? Immediate family. Oh, that's really terrible. I'm sorry you went through all that. Yeah. But yay for mom for raising you in a Christian home and giving you that legacy and that foundation. Yeah, I'm going to hear more about your faith as your story continues, but when did you go into the military or when did you decide you wanted to go into the military? I went in at 17 years old. Yeah. I lived in Castor, Louisiana, pretty much my whole life. And Castor is a very small town, actually the center of the village. I'm not sure what our population is, but I'm betting you it's below 1,000. And I'm not sure exactly how much, <laughs> and I don't want to misquote, but yeah. And so we end up moving to the city, my sophomore year of high school. And uh, we went, uh, my mom got sick, really sick. She had congestive heart failure. And so we were back and forth to Houston, Texas, to St. Luke's Municipal Hospital every week to visit her. And thankfully she ended up getting a heart transplant my senior year. And so. I didn't really go to school. Like I was always, the books were always easy for me, right? I was always free and still growing up. And so my plan was to go to the University of Louisiana Monroe, major in psychology, minor in social work. I even had a scholarship. I was on the debate team. I had a scholarship for debate. Yeah, there was a whole plan, right? I was going there. I was doing it. Applied, got accepted. Went and talked to this recruiter and <laughs> he convinced me to go to the military, right? And I think it was the traveling and going to school at the same time part that really stood out to me. And I'm like, you know what? I'm young. I want to live and I want to see the world. And so I listened to them, went to basic training. They're very convincing, <laughs> I hear. They are very convincing. Right? I like timeshare <laughs> salesmen. Yeah, here's the road. They said it on the dotted line. Yes, indeed. They have a knack for reading people, right? And reading what they want to hear. And he knew I was into excitement and I like to live the free life. And of course, he made it sound so exciting and so free. And I could do all of these things. And not to mention just wearing the uniform alone was just magical. You know, the dress white. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like you instantly get respect when you have the uniform. Anywhere that you go, you instantly get that respect, right? And so I wanted that. I needed that. And so, yeah, I went to the military with the basic training in Chicago, Illinois, in 2007. And I had to lose like 40, 45 pounds in basic training so I could graduate. Yeah. Mm. For your height, you have to be a certain weight and you have to have a certain weight inches requirements. I forgot what you call it right now, but yeah, there's certain requirements you have to be for your certain height for a woman. And so I'm five foot three and I'm supposed to be like, what is it? Like the body mass index, right? Right. I'm supposed to be like what, 140, 50 pounds? There no way I'm 140. I've never been. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> but according to that, I was supposed to be there or either had a certain waistline, a certain neck perimeter, a certain all that. And so I had to exercise a lot. I had to go, like, I had to eat nothing, pretty much nothing but salads and stuff. But mm -hmm. I lost the 45 pounds because we were constantly working out through back training. Like, literally, they would wake us up out of our sleep just to do some push up or sit up, right? Or run in place or something like that. And so I was able to lose the weight in time and I didn't have to graduate in a later date because that does happen where you go back to training and either you can't pass like a physical exam or you can't pass like the intellectual exam. They'll give you another chance, but you won't graduate with the people that you started. Mm -hmm. I wanted to graduate with the people I started. So like I would be embarrassed if I did it. I was able to graduate on. Yeah. And then I had orders to belong and I was super excited. Yikes. That's a culture shock right there. Very much a culture shock. Yes, indeed. I was, ex I mean, I was a little, I was excited though, because a small town girl like me going to a freaking tropical, tropical island, right? That's all I knew about my, I didn't even know of Guam until I got stationed there. And so, because we was, I was, we was sheltered growing up. I mean, we know about life in the world, but like our whole plan like our mother instilled in us, like go to school, go to college, get a job, start a family, that, that little step thing in your life. And that, that's what my goals were. Go to school, go to college, start a family, get a job, all that stuff. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. But yeah, long, long gone. My so dad told stories of all the places that he's traveled when he was in the Navy. And he tells the story about how when you cross the equator, there's this initiation and he's got it on video, real to real oh. video that I've seen where they have this big fat guy with grease all over his belly or something. And everybody had to put their face in the guy's belly and all these different initiation things. And my, my dad was in over in, the, in Asia and brought back this hope chest from, I think it was Japan. So my mom still has this hope chest that he brought over on the ship and all of us kids were like, well, my sister and I were like fighting over who gets that hope chest because it means something to us. It's really yeah. beautiful and hand carved and intricate and yeah, you oh, can wow. go to all kinds of great places. Did you go anywhere besides Guam? Yeah, that's not so beautiful. Yeah. I went to uh, Okinawa, Japan, Hong Kong, Thailand, Australia, South Japan, Singapore. Um, there you go, Garcia, Hawaii, oh, and Russia. Went to Russia as well. Wow. Yeah. So I hear that you, that you drove the ship. I, I drove, I was operation specialist. And so we worked with, we worked on a bridge. And so I was able to learn like some of the radar part of steering the ship, driving the ship, and also the helm and lee helm. So those two go together, the helm and the lee helm, when you're operating, when you're steering the ship. So that was super excited, exciting to do. Yeah, it does sound exciting. Now, it wasn't all unicorns and rainbows and fun. What happened after that? Well, when I got there, I started making some friends. I was a little tomboy back then, so I had mostly male friends. And in the Navy, people probably know about this. Well, I know they know about this, but sailors drink. That's what we did. We drunk when we got off on weekend and we would drink when we got liberty, which is freedom and free time in other countries. And so I went out partying with some friends one night at per usual, but this particular night I got more drunk than I usually would get. 
think that's the most struck I'd ever been yeah. up to that point. And Dan fan having fun, and I got extremely drunk, and I asked one of my friends to take me back to my room, and he took me back, and he raped me. And so I didn't remember everything that happened. I just remember flashing, but I do remember him saying, oh, man, I shouldn't be doing this, but she won't let me do it any other way. And I remember mm -hmm. that so scary, right? So clearly and so vividly. I can still remember his facial expression when he said that, like, he was, he wanted to do it. Did. I struggled with it for a while after that. I'm like, I felt like maybe if it was my fault, maybe I tried to come on to him or maybe he, did, he didn't really want to do it. I mean, there's so many questions that ran through my head and that in a way I tried to let him off and not make him take responsibility for what he did because of my self-esteem. My self-esteem because of the way that I view myself, so all that self-esteem issues, the low self-esteem I had grown up, this made it 10 times worse. Now I'm looking at myself, it's, it's disgusting, like I'm nothing because I was a virgin when that happened. And I wanted oh, to no. give my, yeah, I wanted to give myself away biblically. I wanted to wait till I got married. I was dead firm on that. And he took that choice away from me. So you say you were too drunk to even consent to that sort of thing he just took advantage right right That's yeah terrible. i know i know that now i yeah. know that now but for years i struggled with the way i saw that night because mm. I, I wanted to blame me or i wanted to give both of us equal blame because i had to do something because he was supposed to meet my friend oh so know? this is somebody you trusted it was yeah somebody I trusted. yeah Oh, well, that's doubly hard. I mean, it's hard when a stranger violates you and when it's your friend and you think you can trust this person, it's even worse. Right. It was somebody I trusted and also somebody I secretly had a crust on, right? And so that's a lot of the turmoil in my head came from that because I'm like, but I like him, right? I didn't give him consent, right? I did not tell him yes. I did not want that to happen in that way, right? And he knew how drunk I was. There's no way you should do that to somebody when they're in and out of consciousness. Like no excuse for that, regardless. And I had to come to a point where I saw it like this. It wasn't my fault, right? And I have to, for one, take responsibility for my drinking, but what happened was not my fault, regardless of the situation, the circumstance that was surrounding me. Because I know there's probably a lot of people out there that probably got violated by people that they may have liked, that they, they were friends with, they may have had a crush on, and there's so much turmoil in their head, which is, in my head, fault. And about blame, it, it's shameful. I was ashamed. I was truly ashamed. It, it just not only of what happened, but, but who I became because of it. Do you think that the military culture is to blame for that? Is this what is expected, the norm, for uh, being on shore leave? Or you think that's not just a military issue, it's for everybody? I believe it is a really big military issue. And it is the norm now because there are a very high percentage of women and men who get violated year round in every branch of the military and nothing is known about it. The perpetrators get away with it. It's reported. Some, actually, more often than not, it's reported. But there are times when it's not reported, but when it is reported, they get off and they still get to keep their rank and stay in while the victim has to leave being called crazy, diagnosed with PTSD, and given a medical dis honorable discharge. It's an honorable, honorable medical that kind of go hand in hand. But yeah, it's honorable medical, but there's nothing that happens to the perpetrator, the person in their big, right? They get to keep their rank. There's usually an officer that does an officer that does it to a lower rank, and they're able to keep their rank, keep their position, even advance at some point. The display in, I wanted to do 20 years. I wanted to make a career out of the Navy and I wasn't allowed to because they made me get out.
they met for me. They may think it up for maybe. I didn't want Oh, that's terrible. And it was like the perpetrator gets to go on and assault more people, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I have a best friend. He's a guy. And unfortunately, he was gang raped in the military. Oh, no. So we met board out around the same time. I met him in the Naval Medical Center, blah, blah, blah. Because after it happened, my whole life changed. Like, I changed to my core, the whole trajectory of my life. And it got back to my chain of command. My chain of command had to do something about it, right? So I had to go talk to the psychologist. I had to talk to NCIS every day for months. They even had me wear a wire to go talk to this guy to get him to confess. He never did. They had me call him while the phone was tapped to get him to confess that he never did, right? And going through all that, trying to do my job, trying to not look embarrassed at the same time because I felt like everybody was looking at me like I was just this broken thing, this weak thing after it happened. And so I struggled with suicidality. And I, I tried to commit suicide. I took 145 pills. Mm -hmm. And I ended up there. And, but thankfully, gracefully, somebody came to my barrack room that night and found me and got me to the hospital. And so they made a vacuum to San Diego, the Navy Medical Center. And that's where I met my best friend at. Yeah, he was gang great. Then nothing ever happened to the perpetrator. And he got medically discharged. And we've both been struggling with PTSD for years after the course of 10 years, actually. Yeah, I'm sorry that I've been to your friend. You're still in contact. You're still friends. Yeah, yeah, we are. That's good. Good to have some support. Somebody knows what you're going through. And we see all these TV shows like JAG and NCIS, I've watched those and they're really great shows. I mean, how your dealings with NCIS, was that realistic to what they put on the television or not really? Somewhat, somewhat more no. Than and then the thing about it is when they approached me, it was two, male, two men. I had to talk to two men about it. right after it happened the whole time. There was never a woman. In NCIS, when I was going through this. Yeah. And that's the first time I've actually talked about this. The first time I've actually, like, triggered that memory. But yeah, it was two men. It wasn't even a female that they had me talk to. But no, the process, it wasn't nearly like that on TV. They wasn't that interested. They wasn't that devoted. They didn't do all that for me. Not at all. They, uh, if there wasn't enough, like, clear evidence, it didn't seem like they were going to try to find any. You didn't have access to your rape kit or you didn't decide not to do that or because of the so, shame. Yeah. But when they found out about it, it was already a couple of weeks later. Yeah. There was no rape kit or anything. Uh, if there was supposed to be one, they didn't do it. That's crazy. Well, I'm sorry that you had that unfortunate end with military service. Would you like to go back to the military if they would have let you back in or... You're pretty much... I, honestly, I would still go back. When I tell you I love the Navy, I love my job, I love serving my country. I guess that discipline, that, that value system was there before the military. And so the military kind of gave me purpose for that time of my life. And for a while, I would have still, I would have still went back, regardless. <laughs> However, I think now, at this point in my life, I think my calling, my passion, my purpose is somewhere different. It's in Christopher than speaking, advocating for others. I think that's where, I know that's where my passion, my purpose. Yes, we need more advocates. So I'm grateful that, that you're out there telling your story and helping others that going through this too. So what happened after you left the military? What was your life like then? Well, I feel I go. got my medical discharge. I came home back to Louisiana. I uh, got introduced to drugs. My family member, I was looking for ways to cope. And I remember so vividly feeling alone and scared. And I was looking for any way to not feel like I was feeling. And so 
Yeah, I got introduced to cocaine, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, to kill. I was willing to try anything and everything to make me not feel. And over the course of 10 years, I struggled with addiction with alcoholism. Alcohol was my drug of choice, but I did do drugs as well. And so drugs began to just rule my life. Drugs ruled my life and it was like no longer about not feeling. It was how am I going to stop using this drug and doing anything and everything to get it and leaving all my responsibilities lower than my mind, but still wanting to get high and to get strong. I knew at some point I was going to have to face my childhood trauma and my military trauma if I wanted to heal. But I got introduced to drugs, started using. It just, I was in and out of rehab, in and out of jail at one point, in and out of psychiatric unit. It was just a hurricane of trauma. Hurricane of just, a, it was just a spiral, turmoil. I wouldn't wish that on no one. I mean, addiction does not discriminate. And it's in every family, honestly. In this country, it's within every family. Somebody got a brother, sister, cousin, stepsister, whatever. Somebody, everybody has somebody they know they struggle with. And that's how mm -hmm. out of control this guy. That's how out of control this guy. So I definitely struggle with the dick game. I got married at one point. I was clean for maybe a year. Got married to a narcissistic man who was 30 years my senior. I, I had those daddy issues. I had those daddy issues, that self-esteem issues. So I was looking for love any way that I could get it, right? And it came to me in the in a package of everything that I want. And I didn't know at that point how the enemy worked, right? They send you everything you need in one this big package, right? And so, yeah, I married a narcissistic man. And that was like trauma on top of trauma. All the constant criticism, the disregarding me, the I the, the fake public persona that he always put in, the gaslighting, the, I just, I, I remember having to walk on eggshells all the time. It, it made all of those issues from my childhood and even from the MSC, like just multiply, right? It just multiplied and increased. And there I was, homeless addict at one point, homeless addict, struggling with suicidality. I mean, these sort of things don't happen because you tried drugs for fun. Because that's kind of like the the outside world who has not struggled with drug abuse or addiction. They think, oh, well, you just did it for fun. It's always there's some pain that you're going through and you're trying to numb the pain to get through your day. And that's how it starts. Doesn't mean that you're a bad person. You're a good person. You a believer and you had a career and goals and and you got sucked into this and it's so so hard to get one of my siblings oh. had crystal meth that he was into and i ask him now how did you stop that and he said well i had our uncle who took me under his wing and taught me a trade and got me out of the environment i was in because otherwise i would have been dead or in prison yeah. And yeah, today he's doing great, but let's see the people on the outside. They don't understand that. Right. Right. We're missing purpose. I, I believe the solution is finding purpose. And usually when somebody goes through addiction and alcoholism and they get clean, if they don't consistently strive to find out who they are, to face their trauma, face their pain and find their purpose they're going to more than likely go back out and relapse or continue to keep using. Finding our purpose is our solution. Striving to be better versions of ourselves is the solution, right? Taking care of our mind, body, and spirit is the solution. Like I take care of my mind with meditation, prayer, EMDR therapy, with my, my spirit. I read the word of God. I pray, right? I go through my worship service. And my body, I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I try to take my vitamins and stuff like that consistently. 
So taking care of those three things, finding your purpose, is definitely just those. What about rehab and stuff? Did that help you at all? You know what? I went to so many different rehab, and it seemed like all of them did the same thing. Like CDC, cognitive behavioral therapy, healthy relationship classes, anger management classes, things like that. All of them did the same thing. And, and every time, I would always go back out, right? Go back to keep using. And so this last time, I went to Hero in Opelos, this Louisiana, and they were so different because they made me face me and they made me face my trauma and that work it clicked that's where i got introduced to emdr therapy at, right i'd heard about it previously but every other place that i didn't meet right did they know me <laughs> you know what i mean like i don't i need it i think like the thing the very thing that i didn't try was the thing that worked and so i do believe rehab work right for a certain situations for certain people but i believe the bottom line is you have to face yourself and you have to face your trauma you have to want to love yourself you have to want to get to know you you have to want to heal right the honesty open-mindedness and willingness are three things that without those three things you cannot heal and you cannot move forward you too no, your relationship with God at this time of your life, obviously you didn't lose your faith, right? At this point in your life, God was still there for you, but unpack that a little bit for us. Okay. Yeah. At one point I felt like I lost my faith. I felt like I lost my will to, to serve God, to know God, because I had tried, I felt like I had tried everything to get clean, to stay clean, to be a good mother, right? To be better me. And I, I felt like God wasn't meeting me halfway, right? Mm. So I lost my will. I lost my way. And I don't think I ever forgot the word of God. I don't think I've ever, you know, that without God, nothing was possible for me. I just lost my will to put that to work. I lost my will to even go down that route and even try because I felt like God seen me going through all of this. Why isn't he just helping me because he loves me? Why do I have to put the work in? I'm trying to stop. Why can't God just make it all go away? I felt like that for a while, but I was one of those people that even though I was out there like, in active addiction, using every day, drinking every day. I couldn't steal from nobody because I was still convicted. I wouldn't try, I couldn't try to manipulate people or take advantage of people because I was still convicted. You know what I mean? I could not become my environment. I could not become those, those, like those people out there because stuff like that hurt me. It hurt me to see, to hurt people or to see other people hurt. And while I was going through myself, I was trying to help people out of something that I couldn't even get out of myself. That's the type of person I am. And even the type of person I was, even on the street, so compassionate and empathetic to people, period. God just made me that way. And I've learned to love that about them. That regardless of what I went through, I was still trying to help somebody else out of their situation, a situation I couldn't even get myself out of. And so I realized that God never left me. He never stopped protecting me. He never stopped making provision for me. Even when I couldn't see it while it was happening, he never did. And there were times where I did know, okay, God, I know that you had to do that because otherwise I probably would be dead right now. You know what I mean? Where I would go use up drugs, knowing I owe somebody, going around them, knowing I owe them, knowing that they were really street life people and I really could have been killed. That was nothing but God protecting me. I'm going someplace, five minutes later leaving, and then and finding out somebody got killed at the same place I just left. That was God protecting Or finding out people getting killed for owing $10, and I owe 400 stuff like that. It, that's what God was protecting. There were things out there that was only supernatural, divine intervention. And there's no other way you can explain it. 
no other way. And so I knew that, I know that, and God revealed to me that I had to face that thing I was running from, those feelings, those hurts. I had to face even the type of marriage I was in. And I had to face that this whole thing was orchestrated by me. Like, matter of fact, I never even went to God about my marriage, about before I even married him. That was my own deal. I just wanted to be married so bad. I wanted to be in love so bad. I wanted that vision of a family so bad. I never went to God about none of that. I did all that on my own. And I had to face the consequences of my own choice. If I would have went to God about that, he would have gave me discernment, which I had, but ignored because I wanted what I wanted. Right. And so, yeah, just looking back, that was there the whole time. And so whether I wanted to see it or not, he was still helping through all of it. Appreciate you so much being transparent about your feelings and the roller coaster ride of feelings with your faith. I know lots of listeners have felt the same way. I myself going through my abuse, it's like, why are you letting this happen to me? Why don't you fix this? I'm a good Christian. And I thought that God wasn't listening. And of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. When we're out of our abuse, we can look back and see, look where God protected me. He was there for me. Right. And I just wasn't listening. I was not open-hearted. And of course, the drugs do stuff to your brain. I love hearing stories like yours because I think there's a lot of people that feel the same way and they're ashamed that, well, my faith wasn't strong enough. That's why I suffered is because my faith wasn't strong enough. But right, right. God will still take care of us regardless. Yeah, he does. He does. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's not that it, our, our faith isn't strong enough or something like that, right? We have to face the choices that we make. and We have yeah. to be honest about it. Like God was there the whole time, giving us that little nudge, don't do this, don't do this. But I want to do what I want to do, right? And so yeah. I, I make that decision without God. Now I have to face that decision. But even at doing that, he's still protecting me. He's still right. There. Even though I made this dumb decision without God, he's still going to protect me. Anyway. But I have to face the consequences. Natural consequences. And I know we didn't talk much about your kids, but how did that affect your kids through all this, being a mom and stuff? That must have been hard. Yeah, my kids, I gave them somewhat of abandonment. Because at one point I was in and out. There's one thing I can say that I am proud of myself for doing. is when I knew I was in active addiction and I knew I wasn't in the right position to take care of them, I would bring them, I brought them to my mother. And I was honest, hey, I'm not doing right. I don't want them around me. I don't want them around what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I would bring them to my mother. My family has been the biggest help, like the biggest life saver when it comes to my kids because they stepped in when I could not do it and been taking care of my kids and my kids didn't know about the addiction. They just, they knew mommy was sick and mommy was away, but they didn't know. And they were really young when it was going on. And so they won't remember all of that, all the other the major stuff that happened. But yeah, my family stepped in. I'd raised my daughter for the first two years. She's 16 now by myself, right? And then the marriage happened. I had my son. And of course, the addiction was in there. And so I took my kids to my mom. My mom had filed for custody because she didn't see me coming out of it, right? And I let her have custody because of me, but we co-parent now extremely well. I'm with my kids 24 seven. They don't know the legal stuff, right? They just know mommy here. Mommy, me, and Aunt Kika loves them, right? We all take care of them together. That's all they know, right? They don't know the, all the other stuff, but yeah, my family has been major in my sobriety. They're super supportive. And also major with my kids, but it took me being honest about not being able to be a mother at that time and me being willing to do the right thing for them. Cause I could have just kept them and tried to do it. And just because I was ashamed, I didn't want nobody to take my kids. 
No, it's about my kids and their safety, right? And I, I want to prevent them from seeing me in a state that I was in because I was a completely different person when I was drinking and getting high. And I was not the type of person to keep my kids safe. I was not because I was too busy thinking about getting high. But yeah, my kids don't know that side of it. Like I said, there was maybe five years I was in and out. Like I would be home for a while and I would leave out. I was home, then I would leave out. And so I said, like, I kind of gave them abandonment issues because when I came in this last time, when I got this time around, when, when it stuck with me, every time I would leave and go outside or I went outside to smoke cigarettes, and I was like, Mom, where are you going? You know, hmm. literally. Yeah, every time they thought I was leaving, because when I left, they didn't know when I was coming back. And I wouldn't lie to them when I was in addiction. I would never tell them I'm coming back such and such, because I really didn't know. So I refused to lie to them. And so, yeah, they, they were like, hey, mom, where are you going? I go to the bathroom. Mommy, where are you going? Or when are you coming back? And so I thank God that now it's not like that. But now they know mommy here and she's not going nowhere. Now it's an actual relationship I have with my kids. And they know that I'm not going anywhere, that I'm going to stay, and that I, I'm a loving, kind, and present mother now today because of the recovery and because of the grace that God gave. Well, I have to say hats off to you. You made some really good choices, so you should take credit for that. You asked for help and put your children first and when you weren't able to take care of them and you were honest with them, you didn't lie to them. That's huge. That's huge. And thank God for your mom that, that stepped in during a hard time. But yeah, you congratulate you for making good decisions there. So, you know, you didn't already talk about some of the things you did for healing. Let's talk more about the, uh, the jujitsu been a practitioner for 23 years, multiple arts, but jujitsu has always been a part of it. I think jujitsu is very empowering for women. One of the reasons is with assault, you're going to wind up on the ground and it's to be able to not freak out when you're taken to the ground and you are familiar with, okay, step one, this is how I get out of this. I have options. Right. Well, that's very empowering rather than, okay, you get taken to the ground or you're in the middle of an assault and you freeze up because this is unfamiliar territory, took you off guard. And so what was your experience? My experience was very similar. Just thinking about situations that we could possibly be in. And now, because I've been repetitiously doing this, now it has become natural in case situation like that arises, it definitely empowered me. You know, it made me feel a little better about keeping me and the people I love safe. It definitely helped me focus. It gave me more discipline. It gave me clarity, right? And, and also it just it got me back in shape. And we all know that when we physically feel good, we mentally feel good. Yes. Right? So yeah, girl, it got my body back into the feeling good. And so, man. I love to, and all the people that I train with, the people that we train with are amazing too, right? Cause we never really in competition. We're all there to teach each other and to help each other, the best versions of us. And so, yeah, jujitsu, you learn so much mentally, spiritually, and physically. Yeah. I'm glad you found a good school. That's a challenge sometimes. I am hoping I never have to use my physical martial arts skills. I, I have used my mental ones being aware of my surroundings and people following me and escaping and that sort of thing without having to use my physical skills. But there are so many, like you say, there's so many attributes and uh, life lessons that you learn that have nothing to do with kicking somebody's butt. It's, right. <laughs> as you pointed <laughs> out, it gives you all these other benefits. And so I always encourage people to find a school, find an art that that you enjoy. It's great exercise. It's great for mental health. And so, yeah, too bad you're not anywhere close. Like a come visit, <laughs> right? 
Oh, oh no. Anytime you're up in Phoenix, let me know. Well, I actually you. have family in Sierra Vista, so we might have to make that happen. So. Yes, please yeah. let me know if you're in town. <laughs> we will arrange something, at least to meet up. Yeah. But I wanted to give you time to talk about your book. What did you want to say about your book and how you wrote it and everything? My book, Subsequent Pleasure of Living God. God gave me the vision of my book when I was a teenager. He gave me the title of my, my book when I was a teenager, right? And so, but I didn't know, of course, the content, it would be in it. And so it took me all of 2021 to write it, but I knew that it was time, right? Because I finally did the EMDR. I finally faced myself. I finally built a relationship with God and I finally got back in my kid's life on a consistent basis, right? So I'm doing all these things to become the best version of myself. It's time to tell my story and it's time to tell how I'm healing, how I'm dealing with this because it's working. And I know if it's working for me, somebody that's been down this road 30 times, this will work for somebody soon. So my book is about my life. It's about how I heal, what I did to overcome, what I did to learn to love myself. And it's also about what I'm doing right now to keep it. Yeah, I know you, you left a lot of stuff out, I'm sure. But what message would you like to give to the listeners right now who maybe have gone through the same thing that you went through? To definitely become honest. Biggest thing for yourself, right? And then find it in your heart to become honest with another person, um, whether it be a counselor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. But being honest has gotten me so far rather than just trying to fit in or trying to just be like everybody else. Honesty, transparency. Also, you have to be willing, right? You have to be willing to do whatever it takes to make those changes. To make those changes and to heal, be open minded because we don't know everything, right? We're always learning, consistently learning. I will never stop learning, but definitely be honest. Being honest will get you way farther. Just trying to fit in or just trying to be like everybody else. Be honest about who you are and what do you want from your life, right? Because if you're not honest with yourself, you know, honest with another person, whether they be a counselor, psychologist, psychiatrist, accountability partner, be honest with somebody else about just accept what happened in your life. Accept it for exactly the way it is and do the work for you to become the best version of honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. You have to be open. You have to be honest because we don't know everything, right? I'm a forever, always continue to learn because I don't know everything. And I want to become the best version of me. So I'm going to continue learning how to do that and learning how to lay the right foundation for my kids and the people that I love, because we have to live by example, right? That's the, that's, we can't, we can't tell people what to do all day, but if we live what we're talking about, they're going to pay attention to how we're living more than they pay attention to what we're saying and know that you can overcome. And there is a life, your life, where you're walking in your purpose to where you love yourself, to where you're healed and you're moving forward, that does exist. And it takes some prayer, meditation, you doing the work, right? And you have to accept things for the way they happen, the way they are, no matter how much it hurts, because it's only going to hurt for a little while, right? Emotional hurt cannot kill you. You can handle that hurt and you can move forward and be on the other side. But your life does exist with you winning. And with you here. That is so good. I love it. Such wonderful advice. And so we can get your book on Amazon, right? Yes, it is. It's on Amazon. Stuff between pleasure and pleasing God. It's also on my website, www.kimberlycares.info, as well as all my other information. I'll have that all in the show notes for everybody. If you want, you can send me a hard copy and I will promote your book for you on the show. And definitely stay in touch uh, when you come into town. And this has been awesome. I so am blessed by you and your story and you know, to advocate for the veterans so needed. And God bless you. Thank you.
you so much. You have such a warm spirit. I knew that. I felt it before we actually got on to a recording. You have a beautiful, warm spirit. I love just sitting here having a conversation with you. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for the kind words and thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening to the Wounds of the Faithful podcast. If this episode has been helpful to you, please hit the subscribe button and tell a friend. You can connect with us at dswministries.org, where you'll find our blog along with our Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel links. Hope to see you next week.